So our assignment is a little longer than usual today, uh, but we're going to talk about a test today, right? One of my favorite topics. Um, I think where we left off before the holiday and spring break, we touched a little bit on security and risk. So today we're going to dive a little deeper into the ethical hacking piece of security class and talk about the faces. I think some of you are already in the ethical hacking class, which is it. Um, so some of this might be review, but I hope that you will be able to learn a little bit more through today's lesson. So there are different models that you see um, in textbooks and, and, and on websites and through articles. Um, the way that we look at attack faces um, can be broken down into more sets uh, or less. It really depends. But ultimately, we'll talk about the goals and and the task that's involved. So to start in the first part of our notes, um, it shows you the cyber kill chain. And you probably will need to know this, especially if you're doing CDH, certified ethical hacking, but security class will ask you about different faces. Um, so a lot, of, we in general, in education spend a lot of time in the recon area because it's an easier area to really kind of looked at. So in the cyber kill chain, basically you would start out with identifying who's the target, right? Um, and if you're looking at APT, we talked about APT last time, advanced persistent threat, they're either paid to attack a certain group of people or a certain individual or a certain company. Um, so that part in identifying the target might not be difficult. But in the case where if you are a, an ethical hacker, you have to really look at your, you know, a certain organization and things like that, your target is really going to come down to the systems, right? Um, the IP address of the system, where it's located physically. So identifying the target is sometimes can take a little bit longer. And then after you do that, then you would provide or identify the resources to be able to accomplish the next few steps. So it goes over recon. So reconnaissance is just a way for us to research, find information, identify as much information about the target as possible. Then after that in cyber kill chain, and this is really you know from the government area. So you would see the terminology is a little bit different. Weaponization, this is where the attacker would install malware or get people to download malware, um, such as RAT. It's a very common one these days, right? Remote access Trojan, where they can take over your system or access your system remotely, especially for IoT devices. Um, we do see that a lot in supply chain. And, and then embed payloads, um, looking at the type of tools that they can use or toolkit We'll talk about some of the toolkit. And then after that, we'll be able to have some kind of delivery. So the malware, if you're doing a Trojan, basically it masquerades under something else. A lot of the Trojan would feed data to another server remotely, and they would use that data to obtain credential, to have access to other systems, um, and so on. The exploitation usually comes in the middle. After you have installed malware or, you know, plan out all your tools and execute some of the tools. So exploitation usually use exploitation kits. Um, the common one that you see, most people would start out with Metasploit. Metasploit is a framework. We call it a framework now because it has so many different tools, right? Um, instead of just a toolbox that would contain a few, it has different areas. Now there are exploitation toolkits for other things. Like if you are doing web application attack, it's you would use specific toolkits compared to if you are doing wireless attack that you would use a different set of tools. So what you did in the first few steps is really important in how it's gonna be effective in stage four. So as an ethical hacker, if you aspire to do that, right, you have to really do your homework and plan things out. Having alternate plans and having ways, you know, to look at other options, um, thinking outside of the box is going to help. 
So after the exploitation then comes the back door. They would leave a back door so that way they can come back and that would allow them to have more time in the system to pursue whatever the goals. Could be obtaining data, leaking data, um, you know, corrupt additional systems and, and so on, right? Studying more about the internal network and accessing different areas of the, the infrastructure. Now, once they can fully take over, that becomes C2. So the system would then become their bots and they would have full access to the network for most part of the network um, or through some of the system on the network. And then at the end, they would obtain their objectives or goal. Now, as an ethical hacker, you have to first, before you start anything, even researching, you have to make sure that you have an agreement, sign and witness, okay? It's very important for legal purposes. And as an ethical hacker, you would have a scope. Um, for example, if they're only allowing you to do assessment on the web application side of the house, certain web application, that's all you're gonna look. Even if you're able to access other systems through it, you don't look in the other areas. Now, some attacker, right, some ethical hacker or gray hat, they tend to look and then they would sometimes report, but that is also a violation of ethics. So you would only work with your scope. Once your agreement or your contract is signed and go through legal, then you would start the, the process and we would start doing recon because some recon is active and some recon is passive. So when you when you scan and things like that, it still calls home to your system. So it would still, you know, cause a legal impact if you trying to prepare ahead of time and not sign any legal contract. At the end, the main difference between us and the black hat attackers is that we do a final report and we give recommendations, right? Because a lot of the times when they finish doing, obtaining the objectives, they would leave. Sometimes not clean up, right? Um, they would already have what they need and they would leave without getting caught. So in the first question, you can grab that and you can include all those stages and you can summarize it if you want, okay? So I just give you a little bit of, past information for each of the steps so that way you can have a better understanding of what is happening there. Now, reconnaissance can take a few days or it could take months. A lot of the bigger attack that you see, for example, Caesar Palace, right? That would take someone a long time to kind of prepare for that. Um, having, you know, internal information can be important for the attacker. Now, when you are an ethical hacker, you don't necessarily have that internal information. Sometimes you actually get paid to do blind testing. That means that they don't tell you anything about what they have on the internal network, right? What you see is only what's on the DMZ, like their web server, some of the, the public information, um, maybe a little bit of database and, and exchange server or, or outlook, uh, uh, mail server. So now when you have some information in a contract that would be helpful because then you would know, maybe they can give you a segment diagram of the network. Um, you would be able to know what kind of systems that you're working with, what kind of, how many servers that you're working with and what type of server or OS is they're running. So it really depends on the type of job. Now, most of the job based on the scope, they would give you a certain amount of time. So you have to act as an external attacker coming in and being able to see if you can access a certain system or penetrate through, right? Um, a lot of the job on the shorter ones, let's say one server or a couple servers or a small group of server on a segment, they might give you a few days or two days, 28 hours, right? So you would start with going through and, and see. Now, um, and you know, hardly that you would see that they would do the entire network at once. A lot of the times they would test in segments. So you might have like some areas that you would see that would be 
critical system that that's what they want to test first for auditing purposes and for also governance and compliance. Um, as a requirement, right, some uh, regulation would require that they would have audit or external audit from the outside for cybersecurity or even obtaining insurance. Some insurance company won't sell until you have some kind of audit report. So this is when you would see risk assessment being done. Um, audit is about going back and reviewing the gaps in your security. So that's what you see. You can type this out. You can also pull it from the notes that's on the first page. You can see that there. Any questions? Now, do you have to have a CEH certification to operate as a, you know, a, a risk assessor or a pen tester? You can get a pen test plus now certification. Ideally, the industry recognized certification. I have some colleagues that don't have that certification, but they operate because they just have the skill sets. Um, so if you don't get the CEH because it's it costs more, right? The associates is, I think it's about 400 something dollars. But if you go for the full CEH, go above a thousand dollars because I think that's what it sits at now. Um, but what you can do is you can do a pen test plus and a pen test plus through CompTIA is similar. It's not as um, vast or as expensive, I would say. But sometimes you don't, you might not even need that, right? You can go for other certification if you want to be an auditor or risk analysis. There's ISACA and there's others. So I'll show you some of the resources. But you know, pen testing, if you enjoy that, you 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 would pursue that. But a lot of the time you need to also know pen testing technique if you are on the blue team, right? If you're defending your network, because sometimes you have to internally test your systems, test your passwords and test your servers and so on. So the second model that you see is going to be the diamond model of intrusion. So it kind of relayed the same information, but the faces are slightly different in the way they name it. The main four components that you see in the diamond model of intrusion, the first part is called adversary. This is the same as your reconnaissance, but, but a lot of it is to really identify a certain target specific information or how they can be used. So in reconnaissance, in the campaign model, we would go through and we would go through the social media, we would look at some kind of information that's available publicly, um, or even obtain some information via phone, right? Uh, and you do see some um, some attacker would employ technique and pretexting in the first part. So adversary is very similar to that. It is really a way to really identify or obtain additional information. But when you're looking at advanced persistent threat, this is where they would really look at how the target could be approached, right? Kind of similar to the recon. Then with that, they would know what to do, the capabilities, the type of exploits. So this is similar to stage two through four for the kill chains is the capabilities. So looking at capabilities, we would need to also have malware, right? And that could be phishing related. A lot of the times it is, or sometimes that could be ransomware. You see a lot of ransomware lately. It's been around for a long time, but I think the spread of it is pretty quick. Ransomware is actually, a lot of the times they build it to be no reverse. So it would encrypt or lock the system. And even with the encryption key, sometimes it cannot be reversed. So whenever that a, a network is hit with ransomware, usually now most, most of the time people don't pay. Um, sometimes they would pay for some, in order to get some of the critical systems up, but usually it's not helpful. And then looking at exploitations using the proper exploitation kits or the tools for intrusion. Now, some a lot of the people, they would use open source and then they also build their own tools. So scripting can be very useful. Um, and then you would add tools to your tool belts 
to be able to really look at how you would approach, right? Have a plan. And you can have some specific tools that is commonly used. So if I know the network is um the the network is have wireless environment or wireless segment um that I need to test, then I might want to use aircrack ng or some kind of cracking tools for wireless related. And then you want to have like multiple tools, right? When you get results from the tools, a lot of the times, most of the tools we start out with scanning to, to obtain information and then use that information for right? like the now service attack. We'll talk a little bit about that. Now in the infrastructure area, this is slightly different than the coaching in that it also gives you so in reconnaissance, a lot of the time we go and we would find domain information. You can go to who is, you can go to um, I can, you can go to a lot of different organization that lists who's registered, right? And we can also look at reputation type websites. And then through some of our tools, we can obtain email address that would be related to the domain because normally a DNS, the domain name system is tied to authentication system and authentication system is tied to mail servers because in order to access your mail, you have to authenticate successfully, right? To get your mailbox, to be able to have your inbox and your outbox. So with that, you would see, there's a way that we can also obtain, for example, if I need to look for Nike.com employees, right? I can have, I can use Maltego to really go through and it would find all the social media um, type of servers and it's gonna see who is registered with Nike.com. For example, I might have an, an executive that is part of a LinkedIn network that is using that, you know, uh, maybe first initial and last name at Nike.com that would tie to LinkedIn but instead of doing it from one server to the next server, that could take me hours and months, right? Because I might need to find a large group of people. I can use a tool to be able to do that. It will pull it from all the social media that they use, or sometimes they would tweet, right? They would tag somebody through the tweet. So a lot of the public information can be pulled from social media through the tool. And with that, what you can do is you can, from an attacker standpoint, the email address is important. That's how malware gets into the network, right? That's how they're able to fish. That's how, so I think that it's a little bit different than the kill chain model in that the infrastructure piece right here, the additional information will tell you what kind of servers in their infrastructure, in their entire network. And then with that, we would need to find the IP address because in the kill chain model reconnaissance, the IP, the domain, the email addresses comes first. And then you would find the tools to accommodate those things. Now, the in the in the diamond model, it is slightly different that as you go along, once you use the malware and you exploit the system, you can get additional system information. So it is a little different there, right? And then down here, you know, you would then dive into the victim. It doesn't necessarily has to be individual. It, a lot of the times it is organization as one entity. Um, and because that's where the money sits is through businesses. Okay, okay so make sure we know the differences between the models, right? Nowadays, all the all the later certification they have specific model names and their stages, so you can refer to your notes. If you have the textbook, you can look at that, and but you can look at your notes. So in the next part, um, let's talk a little bit about new tray, and and um how that would be different from the, the coaching model. So this is the third model. It is, um, Mitre is a hub for cybersecurity resources. Um, they provide information about, you know, threats. Um, so their, their 
the threat ecosystem is really great. Um, people would contribute for the community purposes. And also there's research and resources that would devote into building out more of a knowledge base for the ecosystem. So mutual attack provides you with, with a model and it is a little bit different than the cyber kill chain in that it doesn't contain procedure, right? Like when you saw the the the, the kill chain model earlier, basically it is step by step, right? We start with recon and we ended up with obtaining the objective. So it is procedural. Where Mitra attack, it doesn't contain a procedure for the attack, but it used matrix, which is type of like, think of it like a table in how things can get checked off. And this is a more dynamic way to really looking at activities and techniques on how things can be achieved for different goals. Okay. So the attackers would go through different stages and it doesn't necessarily have to be one to the next to the next, right? They can jump from for different areas using matrix-based type of um, concept, okay? So what does that mean? What are some of the tactics then? You're still gonna have the initial part. So the goal is to really get into the system. And once you get into the system, you would obtain or access resources. So that's really, in a lot of the attack, right? They just need to find the destination of the target, get into, into the target, obtain the data or corrupt the data or wipe out the system or make it unavailable. So you have to reach that system. So that means that we have to have an initial access. And we know that all the system required credential right, username and password, their credential has to exist somewhere for that system, whether it is local that's stored on that specific system or it could be from the network. So the initial access is important. Then once they're in the system, they would have a plan for execution. So if I'm there to take all the credit card information from the database, then I need to make sure that I get the database table because the database table would give me all the account information, the user information, potential password information, so execution. And then persistence is really staying in there. So this is like what you've seen in the other model where they would install backdoors so they can come back or they can re-access it again. I say come back as in you know, re-access it again. But persistence can also be long-term, right? Sometimes they could be in there for months or sometimes hours or days. It really depends on the level of difficulty in a certain type of attack or how secure that infrastructure is. Now, once you're in and you stay in, you want to move up, right? We can go to administrators or root level. If we're looking at Linux servers, right? You want to be a super user or you want to be a root user because those type of credential allows you full access. So privilege escalation is important. I think this exists in our model. And then um, find ways to cover up. So this is what you see with spoofing a lot, right? Even spoofing to get to the initial access and then spoofing while you're in there and spoofing, basically you're masking yourself, right? You cannot review your identity. And your system really said, in order to connect, it really have to have a source and a destination. It's gonna say, hey, here I am, I'm connecting to so-and-so. So all systems have to either call home or communicate back. So in order to do that, we have to mask several things, right? We have to spoof, we have to spoof our IP addresses, our MAC addresses, which is the physical address to the system. The IP address is a network address. And then we also might have to spoof our table because our table will get us to where we are, right? 
So address resolution protocol allows the IP to be associated with the map. If we're spoofing IP and map, we got to make sure that we spoof the table so that way the switch will be able to deliver us even in the false identity. And then once you are going through the invasion successfully or evasion successfully, um, you might need to access other credential in other areas. And then with that, you would discover more, right? Discovery in the kill chain is at the beginning. But I feel like Mitre model is effective because as you, we, as an attacker, they don't know 100% of what that network will contain, what kind of system, information that system contains. So you do have discovery through the process. And then moving across, right? So if, if the company has also owned other businesses, um, like other domains, that might be a way to also access related businesses or, you know, um, subdomains or child domains. And then collect and extract information. So exfiltration is just about siphoning the data out or the information out, right? So once you collect enough data, then from an attacker standpoint or point of view, exfiltrate sell that data, put it on the dark web, have someone bid on your data, and then be able to exchange it through the forms. And then become, so this is similar to the other model, command and control. So once you're in, you are already at the highest level in the credential and access, you can access the, the data and all the information that you need, you can now control. So I can control specific things. I can control web traffic. I can control, it really depends on my scope, right? My objective. So with that, from the defensive side, you have to take a look at what areas that you need to close. All of these things, you're gonna see four or five things that's gonna come back to access management. Access management, access management right? And then access management. And then this is permission control and also, you know, closing out some of the gaps that we have. A lot of it is just they capitalize on vulnerability. That's ultimately it. Okay. Any question? Now, you know, this is your general tactics, right? Um, every attacker is a little bit different and also groups are operating a little bit different. Um, some are more creative than, than others. So there's like a lot of research that goes into this to really kind of look at the, the cases, um, the known cases and kind of see. So historical data and information gives us some understanding on, on how to approach but the breaking news type of attack, a lot of the times they plan that out. And sometimes that can, you know, there are creativity thinking outside of the box and different things to, um, you know, get into some areas that we wouldn't think about, right? Okay, so you can visit mitre.org. And if you go to attack.mitre.org, so you can hold down shift and then click the link. I'm just going to copy. And then you once you visit the site, um, it's going to give you like a brief explanation of techniques for the stages. So similar to the cyber kill chain, you have recon. The takeaway for the recon is to find information, and in order to find information, we scan, right? Whether we scan the network or we scan for the vulnerabilities, 
with the network scan, we also see protocols and we can use protocol vulnerabilities to capitalize on that we scan. So on the defensive side, that also means that we scan to monitor to make sure that all the traffic is safe and good. But on the attacker side, we scan to see what's going on. Okay. When can we come in without being noticed? Once you have the information from scanning, you are going to build out your resource. Uh, an example or a task that would relate to this would be compromise an account. That means that I can send someone a text, let them click on the link, they would reset their password, so say for phishing purposes, right? So they would type in their password, now I have their password, that means their account is compromised. I just click their credential. So with that, we would have to do malware, Right? We would have to do pretext. We have to trick them into thinking that we are legitimate. So phishing is the easiest way to, to get account information and to compromise it. So once you have the account, right, you would you would go through the initial access. Initial access can also be through phishing. That's just not the only way. Now in execution, you can use commands or you can use scripting. Automation is to our advantage and it also to our disadvantage in that scripting can be a lot of different things. I can script to um, attack. I can script to install things repeatedly. I can script to build out botnets. So it really depends on what am I trying to do for the execution to reach my goal. Then persistence, account manipulation. Sometimes I might need to add myself to different groups Right, and that kind of go into the next level, which is privilege escalation. But persistent can also mean that I need to get into development group because they have access to the back door, or you know, back door is frowned upon, but it still exists. Right, we all know that. Um, it's a way that developers can go back to access right the back of the application to you know patch it to install additional features. Uh, you see this a lot with like database applications, with web applications, it happens all the time. And then once I have a higher access token, so you need to have access but not just any regular access. You need to have high level access. And the token is basically a security, um, I want to say a file that contains your security profile. It tells the system what level you can access, right? Whether you can install application, what privilege that you have on that system, or you can uninstall certain things. Um, different actions that you can take on that system. So with that token, if I can get a hold of that token and through web application, it's really easy. It's through session ID. And sometimes that comes in a cookie, okay? So for example, you log in to pay your bill, right? This phone, if someone is scamming you, they can capture that session ID as you were logging in to your online account. And then if they do man in the middle, cross that shifting and all of these other form of attack, they can pretend to be you, right? They can drain your account very quickly. And this happens to the Bank of India, right? All of these people, you know, they were monitoring 
high level transfer. So there are businesses and individuals that transfer with millions, right? Um, and they would do back transfer. So attackers would monitor like what's being transferred. And this is done with proof of currency too nowadays, right? Um, so they would monitor the activity, study like the pattern or the things of the system, and then be you know be able to impersonate the system or the account to come in and process. And then all that is is transfers, you know, system to system, right? Just send it to a different destination, send it to a different account. And that's how things can be lost. But, you know, it, but sometimes they would need to come back, right? Because it might not just be one transaction, it might be more. Then once you're in and you're doing your thing, you would then need to hide the artifact. So um, go become invasive, evasive where you can't be found. That is actually harder to get there than getting there because a lot of the times um, all systems communicate, like it would try to find like who's talking. So you have to, like I mentioned before, you have to spoof, you have to spoof your identity, you have to spoof, so make it be stealthy as possible. Okay. Now, I put down brute force here, but you know, nowadays brute force is like, it's not that successful. You have to be, for an admin to really ignore brute force or if they must be not doing anything <laughs> because brute force can quickly be detected fast. Right, and you can lock brute force. So, you guys know brute force is an enumeration, right? It's a program that runs and it tries different characters, different different numbers, different letters, upper lower case, different tries. And with that enumeration, can be vast. So when we brute force today, you're gonna see the attempts that it goes through, depending on the application and what you set it to do. Um. Sometimes they can just for the system where they, it just try different things. But brute force requires a lot of resources, meaning that you have to have processing power, you have to have the RAM, right? Um, how can brute force be detected? Very easily. For example, if you're thinking about a web application account, like someone would log in to pay online bills, right? Like at the water district. Um, if they do the account lockout, after five wrong passwords, it locks it out for an hour, right? It would notify the administrator. They would look at the email, go into that account, find out who that could be by looking at the public IP address. If it's coming from something that looks abnormal, they would then block the IP address so that person cannot log in from China, Ukraine, or whatnot, right? Um, so, Brute force takes a lot of effort and resources, in my opinion. Now, it's still being done because there are systems that's wide open and, and people would enumerate. So when you're cracking a password, you enumerate through trying different ways. And for the system, sometimes it will, it will reject it, right? You are requesting too many. And so it would say it dropped. So you would then use things like rainbow attack, which we'll talk about later. But brute force is part of trying to get to the credential access. Let me move this down. Okay, for discovery, so I mentioned that brute force can be locked pretty quickly with password policy. Password policy is the rule that we set for password, right? If someone logged in and failed five times, lock them out for 30 minutes. Advise them some time to go look into that account. Right? Security is about slowing things down and it never goes away. Your risk doesn't disappear, it just slows down. Right? So that means that we can take a look at it, evaluate it, and maybe block it, right? Defend it. So with the discovery, what they can do is they can try and see how much they can access. 
if they are limited, that means that it tells me that there are rules and restrictions, right? It's kind of like if you're looking at a family, a kid is going to try to act out until the parents put down the rules, right? So it would they would take it to the limit of the system, so that way they would know that that's the those are the rules that are set. Okay, so password policy, for example, twelve characters. How many failed try? Um, how long do they need to reset the password, and so on? Those are the rules. And with that, we would have to take it to the limit. And then they can do spear phishing for the lateral movement. So if I I might focus on a certain group that would have access to critical systems, IT people, okay, that's pretty obvious. But sometimes IT people are knowledgeable and they don't fall for the, the tricks, right? But then I would focus on higher executives, management that have access to a lot of the critical data. Um, and they would have access to modify data, extract data, uh, and so on. So they would spear fish. That means that they would try to lure these people into giving up credential, giving up information. And spear phishing is different. We learned that already. Then regular phishing, it is focused on specific group or individual. And then they can also collect information. Browser session hijack. Objective there is to gain session ID. <laughs> I'm going to show you. So the next time that you log into your banking account, your online account, on your browser, if you go into your settings, right, any browser, Chrome, Edge, if you go into the settings area, there's an option for web development, okay? If you click on it, it's going to give you these panes, and it's going to show you. So as you log in, you need to have that open. What's going to happen is as you do it, you're going to see your session ID pops up. And if the website is storing your cookie, it tells you the value of the cookie, all of these things, okay? Now that can be stored on your system temporarily or permanently, because if you are use, reusing, so you save your passwords, right? Most people do. So that way they can quickly log in. I, I use TruePass and daily, um, but what that does is it's gonna revert back to some of the information that it saved. So if you're looking at, I'm gonna show you real quick what I mean. You go here, okay? And then if you go into settings, now on the settings, if you can find, uh, let me see if I can, yeah. I have to expand this through. You said it's on the bottom for yes, right. Firefox is the same way too. Developers tool. So when you see this, this is like so it has HTML, it might have JavaScript, it has all of these things. So as you log into your account, a lot of this is gonna be updated. Then you you will find the information. So normally on your session ID, as you logged in, it's gonna tell you the site. For example, if I go to like bankofamerica.com and I log into the, the bank account, right? It's gonna tell you the URL and uh, you know, and then it will tell you the associated session ID. Um, and that value entails more more characters, but I think um, the last less than twenty digits actually refer to your actual session ID. Yes. You have to be completely logged into your account to be able to do that. Or well, it 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 only generate the session when you are fully logged in. That means that it so, trusts you with the credential, okay. right? But someone can intercept that. That's what I'm saying is someone can acquire that trust through that value or that the cookie and they would take that cookie and poison the cookie. They would own your cookie now. That right? would be somebody trying to do it while they're uh, trying to get more clues open or is that just 
or they can try to be you, right? As you open. As you, as you open. So as you logged in, they redirect you to something that's fake and then they would take over your identity. It's kind of like you're, you're, you're being served in line, but then they would say, no, that's not the real person. I'm the real person. He now has to go to another line. And so they would just send you a, a Bank of America homepage where you don't, you think that, oh, maybe something happened to your login. You retype your login. It doesn't work, right? You're like, oh, maybe I forgot the password. Most people don't. Um, so session hijack is very common. All that is, is just to obtain. Now, if it is a non-secure or insecure website, your session information is exposed through network monitoring toward the sniffer, right? This is why we should never access public Wi-Fi, right? Especially at the airport. <laughs> Okay, and then for the next part, exfiltration, automated exfiltration. So whenever, they can set this up on the database, right? Whenever there's new data, that's an if and else statement. If there's new data, send it to this HTTP server, or this web server that would store the data. So they would set up the remote server. Um, and, or sometimes they would corrupt the data. Now, Data loss is the cost money, right? Um, in the case that the data is still intact, but it's leaked. Because the physical data is leaked, the company has to pay the money to find out where it leaked to, right? By regulations, they need to notify customer based on California privacy law. Anytime that they update security rules, or changes the policy for security, they need to let the customer know. Um, so what you would see is that we have they have to make sure that containment is done. Sometimes that's not possible, but there's money, effort, right? Hours that will be involved in containing the data, okay? They already know how much data is lost. You know, the T-Mobile case, you probably heard of that, there's lawsuits or in that case, right? Um, the data is leaked. They they would give you McAfee or whatever to use, but they already know how much data, right? If you get a letter saying that your your account information is impacted, you're part of that list. So when they go in, they pull the database real quick. They pull the the content of the database. If your account is part of that list, then you are impacted. Now, how how high and and severe is the impacted? A lot of times, if you know, if they're able to use your identifiable information for, for data theft, or I mean for identity theft and other things, then it is impacted in more than media. So, okay. Any questions regarding attack faces and models? Make sure we know the three, okay. All right, let's talk about denial of service. Denial of service is really simple, okay? Things that are available, make it unavailable. Web servers, so for example, if you go to YouTube to watch a video and YouTube is now under attack, then no videos are gonna be shown, right? But you have to look at the scale of YouTube for Google. Millions of people use YouTube every day, right? So. If they don't have redundancy in their systems, right, their availability will be gone. So we have to really think about our system needs to be available. That's the A in the CIA. So denial of service attack is a, a way that an attacker can attack a target. So for example, if I attack the, the web server, youtube.com, and take them down, right, that's DOS. Distributed denial of service attack. If I take over 500 systems and then launch the attack from those 500 systems to the target, it's distributed across to the 500 system and those 500 systems become my bots. That's what they use botnets, right? So distributed denial of service attack takes a lot more planning and effort. Right, you have to really look at who's the easily the victim, the victim system, 
that can launch an attack against a single to that target. You often see this is being done now because I might not have the performance level of my system to attack Google server because they have data centers and they have, you know, so my computer, it's all about computer against computer, right? So think about a boxing ring, the DOS is like one boxer against another boxer, right? You're just gonna keep punching until the other one falls down, knocked out, okay, over. Now distributed denial services, boxing ring, 500 boxes against one, right? So now you have the power of 500 system focusing on that one. It is a lot faster, right? And it is more, it's more efficient for the attacker to do distributed denial of service, but it requires a little bit more planning because it's all about processing and storage. Well, at the end of the game, it's, it's that, right? So if the server is very powerful that they use for Google server, then I have to make sure that I have, you know, 10 times, 100 times, a million times more than that to be able to take them out in minutes, okay? All right, question. Okay, let's talk about spoofing. So we talked a little bit on this about false masquerading and, and pretending to be another system. Two main type of spoofing that you see, this is not the only two that exist, but the two main, um, your Mac media access controller, this is an identifier that's given to your network adapter or your wireless adapter. Your phone has it. Anytime that we can wirelessly connect or wired connect in the network, we have a MAC address. Each vendor is given a, a series of MAC addresses. For example, Dell, right? These are owned by Dell. Alienware, they are given a list of addresses to use. And then, so the, the ID, the MAC address, there's an ID section for the vendor. That number really tells you which vendor that is, okay? And then the rest are unique identifier value that will be specific to the system. Okay. So in Mac spoofing, they simply use a tool or a software tool and Mac is really pertaining to how the switch can refer to the system, right? The switch job is to bring the traffic to that computer based on the Mac address. So it's kind of like your house address, your physical house address. And the switch is like the post person that delivers the package. It would know exactly what street or what segment that is on. Okay, the router, like I mentioned before, it just gets you to the town, right? That's the network. It gets you to that city. It doesn't care whether you're on that street next to the freeway or across town. The switch, it cares about that and it uses the MAC address to find your system. So in order to spoof it, one way that they can do is they can access the switch and overwhelms it. Make it not be able to update its table or refer to its table. This is called a Mac flood attack, okay? And with that, I can take down the whole segment. I can go in and modify the whole, that whole street, okay? But in order to do that, I need to bypass Mac filter. So how do we do Mac filter? We filter it to specific Mac address. For example, this is computer number four and it has that ID, right? It's associated that system name to this ID. To filter, the network administrator can say, Okay, only that system, all of these systems are recognized by the number and we would put that those number on the list. You can do this on your wireless router, right? If you, you guys did a lab where we add the Mac filter, we add in the, the Mac addresses. 
So we would allow those MAC addresses and we would block others. So in order to bypass, it's simple. I just pretend to be one of the MAC address inside, right? How do I need to do that? Well, I need to really study the the how the switch communicate with the addresses and be able to take over one of the MAC addresses. For the IP, they just need to change the source address that looks like the IP packet that would be originated from a different source. IP spoofing is very common um, because that can be done a lot easier in the in the MAC address. You have to be internal. You have to know the internal side a little bit more. So we can, you know, we can packet craft. We can do a lot of different things. There are tools to do this. So we would do the attack from a system when it appears to be from a different system. Just use a different public IP information. Okay. So those are two forms that you often see, you commonly see. Any question? Our lab is short, so don't worry. Well, I just want to make sure you understand through this. This I want to point out for operational OT, uh, for technology OT, this is very common now. Um, when you're looking at supply chain and you're looking at a lot of like manufacturing, also industrial-based type of environment, they use... Um, controllers, right? Controllers don't necessarily, they just repeatedly do things over and over again. So for industrial control systems, even in robotics area, um, you see this with shipping warehouses, with manufacturing warehouses and so on. This is a way that we can monitor and manage these systems that are communicating. Ultimately, they have an IP address and their board is a computer, right? But instead of having full OSs, they might just have a function that repeatedly do things. For example, like a robot arm would load boxes onto the crate and then eventually the trucks. So, but now they're being targeted because they are connected, um, they are automated, and so therefore they are targeted with denial of service or distributed denial of service. This is a really big area for cybersecurity right now. It's going to stay for a long time. So if you are looking into that, right, IoT, um, ICS, right, look into operational technology, there are proprietary products that are used um, and created for, you know, certain company. Now, um, Shodan, I think some of you already knew this, but everything that's connected to the internet Internet of Things, your camera systems, um, your, you know, you name it, it's on Shodan. Even autonomous system, it's on there. Okay, so this is a way that you can find public information, and then you can also use binaryedge.io. Okay, the attacker can do the same thing. Okay, so but we want to make sure that we are protecting the system in that only le legitimate users or people would be able to access the services. This is a challenge right now for all of us, even outside of the United States worldwide, right? We see that supply chains goes worldwide, so there's a huge gap in this area. Um, something to look into. So spoofing, we talked about that. Let's talk about sin flood. So the, the denial of service is really about flooding, right? Making things unresponsive because they're too busy responding to requests. So whenever that you access a web page, you're submitting a request to the web server, it says, hey, I need right your page. And the web server would say, oh, here it is, right? I confirm that you connected, here it is, because it's under TCP for HTTP. So a way that they can flood, they can perform the attack is to send a lot of requests at once, 
right? Against the server where it becomes so busy that it cannot respond to legitimate requests. So this is an easy way to launch an attack. Um, now, Synac exists in TCP attack because in order to provide response, it needs to acknowledge right that it is okay to synchronize. So Synac attack is very, very common. Um, and so in the if if in order to acknowledge for the, the packet, the, the client system needs to create a handshake to the server. You said that I'm connected to you. Let's give me the session, exchange the data, right? Now that I'm fully connected. So it's like this. So if I'm the attacker, I know that this is happening. I'm just sending a bunch of sin. Request to synchronize, right? Synchronize with me, synchronize with me 5 million times. And then the system would be exhausted and eventually it would slow down and stop, okay? They can also do SYNAC, right? Synchronize acknowledgement at the same time. So request and response together, okay? So you would see that. So all that is is consuming resources, mostly RAM and processing power. And then network bandwidth. So your connection becomes floored. So whenever that you see a flood attack, Right, if you're on Wireshark, you're gonna see a huge volume coming from that that source, okay? But you can control that, right? There should be a way to balance out the network traffic, like put in proxy, put in controller in how you route things. Your firewall should have blocked like anything that's above, you know, 50, boom, drop it, kick it out, right? Do not allow the IP address to be communicating back. So there are ways that we can control that. And I think a lot of it is overlooking some of the control and this is what happens, okay. But then they can also divert traffic. So how can you reduce the uh, SYNAC attack? Monitor your traffic, right? And you can automate that process. You can set up the, the application to notify you when it exceeds right, a certain threshold. Set your firewall rules to prevent SYN plugs, right? And that could be IP addresses, could be protocol related, it depends on the firewall. I just went over this in my ethical hacking class the other day. It really depends on your type of firewall that you use. Most network would have a mix different type of firewall like packet filtering and so on. Packet filter refers to the packet to check the rules, or you can also do state, stateless, there's different things, but set the rules and customize the rules based on the behavior of your network. You can implement virtual private network for external connection, especially if you have vendor partners. So for example, if I'm Walmart, I have a lot of partners because I'm buying products from people to sell to consumers. So that means that I have to connect with my vendor, right? It could be Disney, it could be, you know, you name it. Whatever that they sell, the, the shoes that they sell, the products that they sell, the food that they sell, to be able to update inventory in the databases, to do, a, you know, account payable and so on. So in those type of connections, we should up, we should set up virtual private network VPN, and that can be done in house, or we can have that as a third party option for the service. And then manage your user access. So access management is important. You only need to, you know, I highlighted the top three because those are critical, right? But these are also important. Manage the classes of data and who can have access to those data, to the data, and then make sure that we have redundancy. Back up your data. And then have failover system. I think denial of service attack, if you have failover clusters, 
servers that can jump in in the case that the other ones are being attacked, right? When you get the attack, you need to stop the services right then and there for those servers and get the failover to kick in. And sometimes that can be slow and fast for the company depends on the resources that they have. It might sound easy, right? But incident response is always intense. Um, it could be a few hours that you're going through that or it could be a couple of days. So earlier we mentioned that someone can intervene as the man in the middle, right? Intercept your traffic, intercept your services. So man in the middle is often being performed with another type of attack. Cross-site scripting, SQL injection, impersonation, doing, uh, you know, spoofing. So man in the middle, when you see man in the middle, you know that there are other additional attacks that will come with it because man in the middle, its job is to intercept. But for what, right? To, be, to have false identity as an attacker, to, you know, inject into the, the, um, the database servers to obtain more data. So that would be additional attacks. Now, this is concept-wise, right? Um, as you know, Kerberos is recommended by Microsoft. It's good, but nothing is foolproof. We have to have a layered approach. So how can you prevent man in the middle? You can, in the Windows environment, we can use Kerberos to make sure that there's mutual authentication, right? That So when the client connect to the server, it needs to be mutually authenticated. It needs to say, here, this is me, right? I need trust, and then the server needs to do the same. In a lot of cases, we don't have that. We only have a one-way uh, trust. That means that the client just say, hey, I need you to connect, I need you to trust me, and the server say, so what's your credential? And the system say, here it is, and it says, okay, trust. Right, but you need to have a mutual authentication that doesn't allow other system to intervene. So when they can intervene, that means that they can intercept the conversation. Okay. And then we're gonna come back to encryption. Encryption just slow things down. Encryption is only effective if your key maintenance is effective. Because once that key is leaked, it's open sesame, right? So you, when you're using encryption for authenticated sessions, so most websites use HTTPS, they use encryption. They use SSL or TLS, mostly TLS. That uses RSA encryption. But they're not gonna brute force your authentication, that's a waste of effort. They're gonna go find your key, right? If you are barring your house with golden rods and locks, I'm gonna find the key to the lock. So um, for your authenticated session, when you logged into your secure website, you establish a trusted authenticated session. With that, you're given, your system is given keys, right? So whenever that you click back, you know that session ends, right? It doesn't renew. Well, if they do the website correctly, because <laughs> I said, I found some web apps and assessment that when you click back, it's reverts back to your cookie and it's to restore the session, right? And same thing with mobile app. Mobile app is a web app. It's just, you know, visually it's made for mobile platform. So, with that, you you establish some kind of keys to be able to have that trusted session so you can pay your bill, transfer your, your money, whatever that you do, okay? Now, for using something with PKI, your key pairs, so one key is going to encrypt 
and the other key is going to decrypt. It doesn't use the same key, right? So using PKI public key infrastructure is much better than using shared key infrastructure. So most of the stuff that we use is revert back to PKI. Now, encryption is only as good as its algorithm, okay? And how the, your key length and how you maintain your key. But encryption does take a lot of system resources and it slow down. So with that, you have to weight the difference, okay? Any question? No question? Okay, so unpack attack is the next part here. It's also known as man in the middle. It is a way to eavesdrop. Now, if you're using secure shell, so I taught security for a long, long time. Um, I remember maybe a decade ago, we used to harp about secure shell. Everybody uses secure shell because this is a way that we can. So if I need to configure a router, I would I would use SSH to connect to it. If I need to configure a system, I can remote in from my home in the middle of the night in case the system is malfunctioning or I need to troubleshoot, I need to install updates, right? SSH is the way to go. It's been around since the 70s. So, but Secure Shell is accessible to on-path attack, okay? That means that someone can intercept, someone can perform a man in the middle, and it is better than using Telnet though, right? <laughs> so what is an indicator for on-path attack? you are going to see that your traffic is slowing down tremendously because now it's being screened or monitored by someone else. And it's also need to encrypt and decrypt. So in order to read your traffic, they need to decrypt your traffic and then encrypt it back to send it back to you. So that way that you don't know that they're in the middle intercepting, right? So traffic that is encrypted needs to be decrypted and re-encrypted again. So it's definitely slowing down. So when you do see the, the slowdown in your bandwidth, right? So your throughput, let's say that normally you're at close to 100%. We never really have 100% throughput in IT, right? But now maybe you're being attacked, right? You are at 80% or even slower. Um, and then people are going to complain. They're going to file tickets saying, hey, I don't know what's going on. I can't do my work like this. My, you know, I, my, I'm not getting any, the website is not responding. My application is not working. It takes a long time to load, right? So you do see a lot of like traffic delay and that's the first indicator. Okay. Now, man in a browser, I think we do a little bit better job at this to make it more secure. So this is where they capture your session data. Like I said before, right? You can, they get your session ID, such as your account login, and they would use what's called a proxy tro tro trojan or a keylogger to do this. So they would intercept your session, your traffic, your trusted traffic on the browser. Cybersecurity is about knowing specific things, right? Tools for attacks and then tools to defend attacks. So as we mentioned before, HTTPS, the secure website that you visit, uses SSL or TLS. There's a way to strip SSL and TLS, commonly with SSL, because it is vulnerable depending on the version, the older version was. 
So the process in in stripping that is that they just need to change the HTTPS connection to non-secure, okay? We're gonna make it secure to non-secure because this uses encryption. So HTTPS uses encryption for TLS or SSL for the session that's established. So whenever that you use, most of our website now is required to be HTTPS, but to attack that, they would need to make it not encrypted. All encrypted session is decrypted. So they just need to redirect the traffic and intercept the decryption portion. It becomes not secure. And redirection, you can do DNS poisoning, you can do cookie poisoning. There are many ways to redirect someone or a system to a different destination. And they wouldn't even notice, right? So earlier, we, we learned a little bit about Mac flooding to overwhelm the switch. So simply it's gonna overload the physical port, the actual connection on the switch where you plug in the cable, that port, let's say port 21, right? That physical port with different MAC addresses. As it receives different MAC addresses, it needs to update its table. The switch has RAM and it stores the table that is smarter than the hub where the hub doesn't store much, right? The switch can determine if things get there or not, whether things are stale or not, right, on the table. So as there are so many addresses that's being generated or sending through that port, it needs to update the table. It's gonna run out of storage. Like I said before, right? It's a game about processing and storage. So if you have a buffer overflow, you overwhelm the switch where it has no more room to store. The addresses don't stick and it fails, right? That's a Mac flooding. When do you see this? You see this with man in the middle. You see this with denial of service. Um, a lot of this comes to the internal physical network. So they might include, they would do it for spoofing purposes, right? It also depends on preference and approaches too. The types of attacks that can derive from ARP poisoning attack, right? Address resolution protocol is ARP. When we type in ARP-A, I show you that at the beginning of the semester, right? You see the entry for your system. So whenever that your system communicate with the network, it has also a table and the switch has the table. So when you're doing a poisoning attack, you are modifying, right? Are you corrupting or you're changing the content of that record or that table? So this type of attack can derive into ARP, which is man in the middle or denial of service. For DNS, domain name system or service, depends on how you look at it, but DNS, this is a server that takes URL and associate that with IP address, right, public IP address. So you have root.com and that will relate to a certain IP address. So when people type in the URL, it will be able to associate that and point it to the web server. So the attacks that launch against DNS would be DNS poisoning. So in order to associate the URL to the IP address, it uses a record called the A record. A record, think of it as a file. And on that file, it would say google.com, has this IP. So whenever the user put in 
the domain name, it would relate to that IP. If I take that record and modify it, right, google.com and another IP, I redirect someone, right? So DNS poisoning is about modifying the DNS record. And then it has the quadruple A record, right? Depending on IP version four and version six. And then also if I do a reverse, so if you type in an IP address, it would reversely give you the URL. So they can also poison that too. And then farming, they can also do denial of service attack on the DNS, overwhelms it with a lot of different requests. Anytime that you have a web server, you have to have a domain name service, okay? Always. Whenever people register for a domain, when you buy a, a domain space for your business or whatever, right? That's a DNS that you are buying and it's hosted by someone, GoDaddy or any of the companies that you see or Amazon. Okay. So how can you prevent DNS poisoning? And this is now equipped with all the feature that you see, especially with Microsoft. When you install DNS, I'll show you guys how you can do that later. You can enable this feature called DNS Sec or Domain Name System Security Extension. This is a way that we can protect the records. Remember, A record or quadruple A record. Those records are so important to the server. We have to protect it to make sure that no one can modify it. It has to have integrity. It's meant to be configured a certain way, right? And there should not be unauthorized access to those records. So when you install DNS, these records get installed. Then you also add the feature for DNS set that allows the system to protect those records. This didn't exist before, a couple decades ago, and then because of the security need, right? Now, the operating systems, what you see with Windows environment, you would see that it has that. And if you use Linux, it would have additional package for you to enable security for that. Any questions? Okay, so sorry, let me switch over to the notes. We talked about the SSL stripping attack. Um, they can also do cloning, which is a way that they can replicate that address, right? Make sure we read about ARP. ARP is a very, very common thing that's gonna come up in all security classes because whether you're looking at ethical hacking or networking or, you know, ARP is very important. Okay, so for farming, um, so we know the DNS, poisoning where they modify the records or they they jeopardize the integrity of the record. Farming is a similar approach. It really manipulates the name resolution process, which is related to the A records or the quadruple A records, um, or they can just corrupt those records as well. So it is a way that they can corrupt the server or the re name resolution process, which ties back to those records anyways. And it is a way to redirect the, the user. But what they will do is they would also modify the host file on the client side. So if you're connected to that domain, um, your host file is located in the system 32 and under the drivers for Windows, right? This is just how Microsoft designed their OS. 
This is a way that we can map the IP address to the host name. So for example, like, like your computer would have computer four for the, the name, and that is associated with a certain system address. And this is a way that it would be able to identify which system that is based on the name and or the IP. So on the client side, your host name or your host file is in that path. So you can find it in the folder. Okay. Under ETC drivers, system 32 under windows. And to access this folder, it should be, you know, administrator privilege level, at least at the local. So we use NTP server more often than you think, right? Uh, NTP server exists with your mobile platform. When we have daylight savings, that's used. When you go home, when you travel, you connect to a different network, right? It updates the local time there and so on. But NTP can be used for amplification attacks. So whenever we say amplification, it's just multiplied large. And it often is used for DOS or distributed denial of service attack, right? DDOS and DOS. In Linux environment, the attacker, if they're using Linux, they can use a thing called monolith. It is a command that sends a group of hosts that's connected to the server. So for example, right, like I, my infrastructure is T-Mobile. I might have like all of these servers that are connected to my NTP server. So that way it can synchronize and updates in different local and different regions. But in order to attack them all at once, I can just, as an attacker, I can use the command to hit many hosts at one time. And with that, they would also need to spoof who they are, which is the source IP, to send that command, right? Because they know that there would be firewall that's gonna kick them out if they it's not, the IP is not recognized or allowed. So they would find the what IP is allowed on that network, use clone that IP address and spoof it, and then use that to be able to send the command through the network to all the targeted system at once. So to identify what would be a malicious domain, I think now there are websites that you can also go to to look at their um, credibility and their ranking and so on. But as administrators in the back, how can you identify malicious domains or websites? You can refer to DNS log files and you can monitor the traffic. Um, there are reporting systems now on uh, water holes and websites that are malicious. So you can use public community-based resources as well. But for our world, it's going to be log files and traffic. Almost there, just a little more. We're at 6.30. So in the next part, it's going to go over replay and relay attack. So replay attack is someone, in order to do this, they need to do man in the middle. Replay is often used with man in the middle. They need to intercept your traffic. So they would capture your data 
through monitoring tools and then intercept the data and then modify the data. So looking at your payload and then modify your packet content, we call that packet crafting or packet stuffing. And then impersonate to be kind. So whenever that I can craft the packets, I can bypass the packet filtering firewall by doing what? Packet fil packet filtering firewall, it looks at, at the packet information, source, destination, right? And then most likely they will put rules in for like payload size, IP addresses, where it's coming from, where it's going to. If not in those rules, kick it out. Okay, so if I need to bypass the firewall, I just need to make sure that the packet label modified. Packet label is modified, right? Like the packet information is the packet information is part of the network, so they can make themselves as a source and not be able to be identified or blocked by the firewall. So that means that they have to impersonate a client system of the original session. So with impersonation, they have to do man in the middle. This is often being done with um, evil twin attack. Um, a lot of the time you also see cases with wireless network because that can be easily done. Replay is very common for wireless because it's easy to scan the wireless network, look at the packet information, take that, modify it. Any question? So NTP information, we went over there, URL redirection, domain hijacking. Um, I referred to earlier, you can find reputation for domains. There are websites that does that. People call it sinkhole or sometimes it would be referred to other things, but DNS sinkhole is um, a way to modify your the DNS server to give incorrect or inconsistent result. Here's replay information, wired and wireless. So if you use protocols, secure protocols that have timestamp, because um, that it it does it cannot be reused because in order to do the replay attack, they need time. They need time to modify and extend it. So we we if you use it with the timestamp and you can control it with the window of time or time to live, um, then you can reduce the risk of replay. All right. So brute force, when we do web application today, we're doing an online brute force, right? When you log in online, you access the account. You can also do an offline um, where you don't have to be connected. So. Let's take this down. So the two types, online and offline. First thing that they're gonna to need to do is discover the online system that's targeted, log on with an account by credential. And it's tried and true, right? Is the brute force. Keep guessing username and password until there's a match. Might sound easy, but it takes time. So the more powerful system it is, the faster it's gonna be able to enumerate. So I can just plug in username, password, and so on. We can create a list with the username and a list with the password. There are a lot of existing lists that is passed around, commonly used username, commonly used passwords, and we can just go through 
So if my list is long, likely that my probability is a little higher, right? I would be able to plug in from each of the lists and see if there's a match. If not, next list, right? To, to control it, you can just do a count lockout. So you can use something like Aircrack, but today we're gonna use Hydra. Um, Hydra is a little touchy, but Hydra is okay, right? We're gonna also use fuzzing. So we can set the account to lock out after so many failed attempts and recommended that you can use secure shell to disconnect the server, I mean, the, the attacker. And you just need to time it out. So 60 seconds or higher for the authentication attempts per connection. So I think if we do a, a lockout and give it some timeout, um, it is, we just create a little bit more hurdles for that, right? For the offline account, they just simply try to use to attempt to discover password by capturing through maybe a list of password from the database or packet scan. If, you, if you're using like non-secure website, if you log in, you know that your password is visible in the packet. When you see Wireshark, you can click on it. Uh, you can actually see. I'm doing a lab for my 41A this this. This time I'm reusing some part from my forensic lab, but we're doing a malware lab where you can just look at like who logged in at what time and how did they download the malware, right? You can see that from a network capture. So if you're running network capture and recording it, you can slice that, look at it. When you look at that packet, you can look and you can see password is, you know, so-and-so logged into this domain at this time and they visited this website, logged into that website, downloaded, the malware and that's how you can find evidence uh, so when you do incident response sometimes you have to find out where that comes from right so you can find password information so packet scan is critical with finding passwords like i said right non-secure wi-fi can be dangerous so how can we reduce it we already talked about account lockout policy we can, uh, we can implement what's called duration lockout. So just buy more time, right? Lock them out after five failed attempts. And then the duration just means lock them out for how long. Some websites are more stringent, 24 hours. You can't, like I try to pay my student loan and sometimes I get locked out. I have to wait until the next day, right? Or I have to call them and they can reset it. So with that, they can have additional verification set. So account lockout duration just mean the amount of time that they're gonna be locked out. The account lockout policy simply is how many attempts that they fail before they get locked out. Make sure that the password is complex. I think now the industry call for at least 12 characters. A lot of sites are still, a lot of, Companies are still using eight, at least eight. That's the minimal. We also don't allow, we shouldn't allow his, historical passwords because, you know, historical password, if that password is compromised, then if they reuse the same password, then it's no good. You guys know what password spraying means, right? So if your password is leaked, um, let's say that they have gone into the database and perform an offline brute force, obtain your password. A lot of people, they reuse their password in, in different places. So password spraying just mean that trying to use the password in different places, just like how you intend it. <laughs> so some, some people would use that password for, you know, their bank account, their credit card, and so on. Password spraying is the attacker would use that password. And they would attempt to anyway.
and then teach the people how to be more secure with their passwords and their login, right? I think phishing is, training is critical. That needs to be done more regularly. And then how passwords are stored. Like, because most of them would store a shadow password and it would be encrypted. Right? You guys know that administrators and the account holder are the only entities that can retrieve shadow passwords. Administrator can retrieve everything, right? So attackers, that's what they're going to focus on. Why would I need to go into that account where I can go in, you know, I can find my way and escalate my privilege eventually to the administrator where I can obtain keys, I can obtain shadow passwords, I can, you know, because the shadow password is, the, the, the store password is encrypted. And in order to encrypt, it needs to generate keys so if they can obtain the keys and they can decrypt the password. So, and administrators or the root user would be the one that would be able to restore um, encryption key in the case that it was deleted, accidentally or intentionally. So when I, perform the cane enable applications for password crack, it capitalized on pass the hash. Password is stored. Any file that you store on the system has a hash value. And that hash value is then, we can use it to identify whether that file is changed. So for example, when you change your password, when your password is restored, it has a different hash value. So in order to capitalize on the on the pass, the hash attack, pain enable uses the the vulnerable protocols that's called Microsoft Land Manager or LM and NT Land Manager NTLM. Guess what? We're still using that in the back, right? For Windows environment. If you don't believe me, you can go in and start look, looking around for in your registry and some of the information. Don't change your registry, however, but yes. So because of that hash value and there are known hashes, like so for example, let's say that my password is password, right? It would have a specific hash value based on these protocols. Well, I just need to match it so it can quickly guess what that password is based on that hash value. You see? Now, a better way to really store your password is to salt the password or salt the hash of the password. So when your password is stored, it's encrypted and there's a hash that's generated. What they're saying is because the hash algorithm can be guessed, we can salt the password, we can salt the hash. Salting just means that we're adding additional characters and values to the actual password. It's like stuffing it, right? So let's say that my hash is one, two, three, four, five, for example, just simple example, right? So instead of having one, two, three, four, five, I can have one, O, two, Z, and so on. So it would add additional bits or characters or values to what is stored. So it is harder to break that hash, right? We're buying time again. We should use complex password policy, password that would be longer, upper, lower case, you know, symbols, all of those things. And then again, we want to make sure that the users are aware and trained. Any question? So coming back to the session hijack, why do they care about session hijack? Right? A lot of these attacks is really financially driven. So... In a session hijack, as I mentioned to you before, it finds the session ID 
and that can be stored in the cookies because when you visit the website, you have that session, that session is, that value for the session is stored in a cookie. I can use that session to impersonate a user that is legitimate to the server. So in this session hijack, they will impersonate the user through the session ID by reading the cookies and to read the cookies, they need to perform what's called XSS or cross-site scripting attack. In the cross-site scripting attack, that is just using a stolen or a taken session ID. And I can use that to impersonate. So by doing that, I would have to insert the ID into the HTTP header because that header is the label to the server. That's what the server sees as what's legitimate or not, right? Because the server is established trust with the client system. So it's going to check the, the header to see if it is legitimate or not. And to change that, I just need to grab the banner so I, I can check what header information is given to the, the clients. Then I need to obtain, with the banner, sometimes I can find cookie information and payload information. Then I would, um, up, I would do cross-site scripting to interrogate the cookies, do the poisoning, and then, uh, modify the HTTP header and then that. <laughs> right, so those are like the simple generalized step for you there. Sometimes you would have additional steps. It depends on, you know, complex of the web development side and then also configuration for security and so on. So to prevent overflow overflow attack, buffer overflow is that it would exceed the buffer or the storage that would be allowable for that system. Some distributed denial of service attack would achieve this, right? Because as it would receive requests, it would then put it on queue or when it's stored. So this needs to go back to the development side where this error handling, right? Uh, and if you've taken programming with me, right, or other faculty, I harp a lot about, you know, exception handling. So in the in development, we we looked at error handling. Error is handling exception. Things can be system related. It could also be routines related. So building in functions and routine to handle exception. Sometimes people fat finger their input, and it needs to. We need to handle the error with that, right? You don't want garbage data coming in. You need to control the data. You also need to control what could possibly be the error. Because if your system halts and stops, right, you lose business, you lose time. So error handling subroutines also allows us to control what can be over overly stored on the system. Input validation is what I mentioned is, you know, controlling how people enter the data. So when you type in your phone number, it should be that exact number of digits in the United States who would have the area code, the country code, and so many digits. Social security number is the same way. So input validation validates me how the data needs to be entered. Why? Because when, when an attacker do an injection, they're going to try to write a bunch of script and put it into that box, right? You just need a comment box and you can inject a script into it. And a script simply could be like two lines or three lines. But if you input validate, you control how many characters can go into certain area, right? In comment, you guys ever notice, it tells you like, oh, maximum 255 characters by standard. Sometimes they only allow you to, you know, if you for YouTube, um, I upload my video and I try to put in the title, right? And the title, they only allow you to have 100 characters and so on, 
right? That's input validation. It's really control how the content should go in. Because the more ADA you go in, I think the more Google have to have space for that data, but also there's risk in injection, right? You can inject into any text format, string based, and then, but you can use the firewall to screen that, to, to block if it's like a query for SQL injection or any form of script, do not send it through, okay? So we can use web application firewall for those things. Okay. And then um, for the common SVLC model that you see, I think like this section is, you know, there are more models. Because I just went over this with my analyst class. But the common one that you see for most textbook, it starts with the waterfall. Waterfall is, you know, one to the next step to the next step, right? If you're looking at a really tall waterfall, it's going to fall down to the next level. And then the next level becomes a spring and then out to the river. So waterfall just means that you can't go into the next step without completing the prior step, right? I cannot design until I plan, right? I cannot design until I talk to the customer. So where agile, you would build software, you build security system, and this this can also be security development lifecycle instead of software development lifecycle. We use the same model approach. Agile is you you test and you build as you go. It's like building a car and driving it at the same time. Sounds risky and dangerous, but it is effective and it is it. But the main key in agile is communication. If you are more regularly communicate with your clients and your team and things like that. Things can be effortless and efficient because if you are going on the wrong direction in the waterfall, right, you don't see it until you beta your system. You're going to be like, oops, I think we have to start all over again. So waste resource and time. But in Agile, if as soon as you start and you see that it's in the wrong direction, you can quickly switch. You can customize it quickly. So you have to come back and talk to the client and say, hey, is this good, right? It's like building a car for someone. So in a waterfall, you build the entire car and you let your client test drive it. If they don't like it, oops, scrap it, do it again, prototype again, right? In the agile, you would have the frame and some wheels on it. And you say, okay, here, drive it. If you like it, I'll add doors and you know other things. So agile is, you know, Test as you go. Okay, so I found um, the cookie security um, type of tool that's online for you. You can visit cookieserve.com. And then you can put in any website, right? Most of the companies now, when you visit their website, they ask you for permission to accept or reject the cookies, right? Some are more obvious. Some forces you to accept because they hide the other button. Well, what can they do with your cookies? Well, cookies tells them about your behavior on your system for marketing purposes. So you can put in the, the website that you want to check. I want you to be more aware of the type of cookies that you are using every day. So that way, you know, you can see how those cookies are being used. So when you visit the site, you simply put in the, the domain that you want to check and it would list, bless you, it would list the type of cookies that are being required or offered through that website. So to name on this, right? I visit the site. I put in the URL that I want. So and then when you click find cookies, it's gonna give you the, the scan summary once it's done. And it's gonna list. Sometimes you would see cookies that are associated with that company and not necessarily that company. That means that 
there's third party involvement. And that would, you know, when you access their resources, you probably agree by clicking term, accept to their, their term of use. Okay. And you would see most of them are advertisement, right? Yeah, maybe one or two for functions. All right. Then for the last part, you are going to use Radware. And this is going to give you a little bit more on um, cookie poisoning and denial of service or distributed denial of service attack. So you just visit this part. I'm going to scheme through it real quick. If you want to read it, you can. You don't have to turn it in today. It asks you to define what is cookie poisoning, how can someone perform that type of attack, and then how can you protect your web server. Um, every Almost everybody's web print. So, okay. Save your work. You can submit it now or the end of the week. Let me stop.